Good evening. My name is Corey Evans, and I'm the chair of the Small Business Committee of Community Board 8. Thank you for tuning in to part two of our program on Community Board 8 Speaks. I'm here with two guests, Andrew Callick and Kelvin Collins. Andrew, we'll start with you. Why don't you tell us a little about yourself and what you do? Well, thank you very much for having me, Corey. It's great to be back on the show. Uh, my name is Andrew Callick. I'm the Deputy General Counsel for Manhattan Borough President Scott Stringer. In addition to my lawyerly duties for the Borough President, I'm also a policy analyst and an advisor on a variety of economic development issues, including the present and future of small business in New York City. Thank you so much, Corey, for having me. I'm Kelvin Collins, Assistant Commissioner for the Department of Small Business Services. And my core responsibility is to lead a strategy to help small businesses across the city get started, expand, and, and be more successful across the five boroughs. So, Kelvin, in uh, part one of this program, Andrew uh, guided me as I started a small business and came through you know, a successful early stage, and I just placed a bid for a city contract. How did I do? Congratulations for starting a small business and getting it to this point. You know, that's certainly part of our mission and our purpose is to launch small businesses and see them uh, grow. And, and certainly we, we want to support that, that growth through uh, the bidding process and through procurement. So uh, I trust that uh, you submitted a, a successful bid. Um, but, but certainly it's certainly a core opportunity for small businesses to grow, leveraging procurement opportunities with the city of New York. So that's wonderful. My business is successful now. I've gotten, that, I've gotten that bid off the ground, uh, and a promising young person comes to you know, my, my attention, and they want to start a, a new project within the business. Now, it's not something that makes so much sense to be a wing of the business, so they want to do it as their own startup. When we think of startups, we often think of them as being separate, but sometimes they're internal, right? How does that work? And that's right, and I think we see it from our universities all the time. We're blessed in New York City to have many of the world's finest universities. We have over 600,000 college students, more college students here than the entire population of the city of Boston. And so what you see is not only do folks come out of college and start their own small businesses, but you also see spinoffs of that small business. And that's what small business can be to New York. It can create this virtuous cycle where one idea, one business idea can sprout many others, which not only creates jobs, but more kind of business development in communities throughout the five boroughs. And, and if I may add, just about a year ago, uh, we launched a partnership with uh, Fordham University. And, uh, you know, they came to us and they said, listen, there are uh, students that are starting small businesses in their dorms, right? Why, why don't we sort of harness that, that, that uh, interest and that, that, that sort of energy why don't we sort of create an incubator, a place where they can sort of work collaboratively, right, and sort of share ideas and share opportunities to grow? And how can the uh, Department of Small Business Services play a role in that? And we said, hmm, why not? You know, this is an opportunity for us. And so uh, together with Fordham University in the Bronx, we launched uh, Fordham Foundry, which is an amazing uh, partnership between a university and city government to launch an incubator alongside an NYC Business Solutions Center. It's first of a kind for us to do it here in the city. So you have students that are very passionate about entrepreneurship, that have marvelous ideas and are looking for an opportunity to sprout those ideas, can work alongside city resources to really encourage and nurture entrepreneurship. So we have a model for that. And, and we think that universities across the city is a, a sort of a great sort of launching pad for a number of small business and a lot of innovative ideas, and we have to harness that. And government can play a role as we've done, uh, as we're doing in the Bronx. Is that a program that could be expanded to other universities as well? Absolutely. I mean, anything we get involved with, uh, we don't just want to pilot it, right? We want to scale it. After all, you have over 200,000 uh, small businesses in the city, right? And there's just a ton of ideas that are uh, waiting to be birthed here in the city. But you also have some of the most amazing universities and some of the amazing students. So we would look to, uh, after we've, we, we've sort of piloted this and developed some model that's uh, scalable, we would certainly look to other university partners to step up and sort of take uh, this and sort of build it out. So we think there are opportunities for growth within this structure. We talked about this, uh, Andrew, a little bit in part one, but I think in the, in the sort of future projections of the city's growth, universities and small businesses that start up out of that can have, a real, can have a real impact on that direction, right? Yeah, and I think that that's where we already see our economy going. We've 
long been a leader in the so-called fire economy, finance, insurance, and real estate. And we need to continue to be a leader in the fire economy. It's a very important part of what makes New York City New York and what makes us run. But we also need the ICE economy, the intellectual, cultural, and educational economy. And that creative class that's emerging from universities now, from higher education, is so critical. And that's why if you live in Community Board 8, you've got to be excited about Cornell Tech and what it will bring to the neighborhood. But it's not just Cornell Tech. It's our entire university fabric, the expansions that we've seen at NYU, at Columbia, at Fordham, and elsewhere, that's going to be really pushing the envelope on what we can do in this economy going forward. So my business that we started in part one was very successful. But there are all sorts of challenges that it faced. And one thing that a couple of uh, folks have come to the community board and come to our committee with questions about is that they have the following question. They say, look, you know, I'm going through all this process. It'd be really great if I could talk to someone who owned a business who'd been through it all before and could, could be a mentor to me. How can the city work to try to increase the ability for a small business owner to meet with people who might be able to mentor them in their business? Oh, certainly. Uh, I think that's a huge opportunity for the Department of Small Business Services. And we've taken a step uh, about a year and a half ago. We launched a, a pilot program, a very soft launch, with an uh, entrepreneur's organization, which is a, an organization dedicated uh, for small businesses. And it makes up of uh, uh, entrepreneurs across the country. And they came to us and they said, you know, we have this uh, pool of entrepreneurs that are hungry to give back. Right? There's, there's really that, that, that interest in successful entrepreneurs to reach back and sort of see another entrepreneur and sort of help show them the ropes. And, and there's an opportunity there for us to make the connection because we have over 10,000 small businesses walking through our NYC Business Solutions Centers every year. How do we connect those small businesses with organizations like those that are willing to give back and willing to show how to avoid certain pitfalls? Because we know the path of entrepreneurship isn't an easy one. It's a huge risk. And so we are playing a role in sort of bringing together a successful entrepreneur and a small business that's launching or are sort of going through some growing pains and sort of figuring out how we can sort of ensure that the path forward is one of success. So we're working on that. And there are great models out there for mentorship already, Corey. Some of them are through SBS. They've got a terrific construction-oriented mentorship program. Some of them are through other agencies like the MTA and the School Construction Authority that have launched mentorship programs that really help smaller businesses grow. And that's something that we need to be just as concerned about as business development from the get-go because it's no good for the city as a whole if we launch a bunch of companies but they don't go anywhere. Mm. We need to help them get off the ground, but then help them expand. And I think that one of our recommendations in, in Growing Gotham, our report about minority and women-owned business enterprises, is that if this program through SBS with construction mentorship is successful, we want to see if it's possible to expand that program to folks offering other types of goods and services to the city so that all businesses feel like they have a partner they can go to who understands how to the kind of intricacies of their business and how to work with the city. It's always great when it's going great for a business and when it's going very well and of course we always hope that it always does but sometimes especially during the startup and small business and even in the, during the growth stages things can can go not so well. What should a business do if um, if they're starting to run into some struggles? Who can they reach out to if they're having trouble making payroll, um, having trouble having trouble with their space? Who can they reach out to? We've heard from small businesses on a daily basis. Um, and about um, five to seven years ago, the um, Department of Small Business Services launched New York City uh, Business Solution Centers. And prior to that, there wasn't any single place that a small business can turn. And so we've created this sort of safe haven. You know, you have an issue as a small business owner. We have centers across the city, 15 centers that you can walk into. You can call through on one. You can sort of get connected to a staff person, an account manager that will sit with you and address whatever the issues you're having. Okay? The idea is that uh, 
we understand that it's not easy to, to launch a small business and grow a small business. And, and so we train our staff to make sure that we can address a myriad of issues that a small business can have, from accessing capital, right, to growing a business. And, and we've sort of tried our best to launch a number of courses, business education courses, because we think it's important in order to be successful that you ought to sort of understand, well, here are some challenges you're likely going to face. Let's try to educate you around those issues so that as you see them, you can sort of devise solutions. But certainly we have uh, staff at our NYC Business Solutions Centers that are dedicated to deliver uh, assistance to business when they need it, but also, too, to address issues prior in a very sort of preventative and proactive manner so we can avoid some of the pitfalls that many businesses see on a day-to-day -day basis. And if I could just add one thing, and that is that I think we have to understand that the very nature of entrepreneurship involves failure. There will inevitably be failures. And America has long been a country where an economy is based on entrepreneurship and understands that failure is part of success. It is part of the pathway that you go down to succeed. You ask many folks who are the kind of greatest business minds of our time, for instance, if you, if you read Steve Jobs' biography that's out now, you know, he, he ended up being one of the most lauded small business to big business owners in American history, but it wasn't all peaches and cream, even for somebody as successful as he was. There were failures along the line. And I think if we demand success at every single turn, then we're actually going to stifle entrepreneurship before it gets off the ground. People need to be encouraged to take risks, to invest in their dreams, to take a chance at a new idea. I mean, if New York is built on anything, it is built on new ideas. No one could be certain that the Erie Canal was going to be successful. No one could be certain that a huge network of subterranean railroads crisscrossing these boroughs would be successful. No one could be certain that building the greatest bridge in the world would be a success and that people would actually trust that it wouldn't tip over between Brooklyn and Manhattan. We have taken risks in New York. New York has always been a risk taker's town and it needs to continue to be that way so that people can make smart investments and hopefully succeed but even when they fail get themselves back up and with the help of folks like Kelvin, start again. Great. How do we encourage uh, entrepreneurs to do that? So how do we encourage someone to start a business, go through the process and uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's not even, not even something that's their fault, they're just the market for dynamics don't work out and doesn't work. How do, we, how do we reach out to them and say, hey, you know what, it might not have worked out this time, but it, you know, that's, no, that's no sign of the future. And you, know, you can go ahead and you can start again and second business might be an amazing success. How can we reach out to people like that? Well, I think you know, a starting point is, um, and, and I, I certainly want to share sort of the government perspective, right? I think, I think the starting point is to let individuals know that government is on their side, right? I think that's at, at, at very minimum, we're here to support the entrepreneurial spirit, right? And, and SBS is one of the, the few agencies that are actually on the side of small businesses to encourage and to say, this is what we're here for. We're here to deliver resources to you. We're here to deliver information, letting you know that we believe that entrepreneurship is important and we want to support that growth. So one, we have to get the word out. Okay, that's, that's part of our challenge. You know, how do we let businesses know that there are resources available to start a small business? And even when you fail, that we're still here to sort of encourage you. And we're here to sort of figure out, well, what is it that you did wrong? Okay, and how do we fix that? And how do we avoid some of the pitfalls? So I think one of it is spreading the word. But also thinking about how do we sort of look at regulations uh, and, and sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of red tape that, 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 that are there can sometimes have an unintended consequence where it sort of prevent individuals from, from sort of taking that step and sort of having them stuck in the system. How do we minimize the regulation, though keeping it uh, necessary where it is necessary, but ensuring that we, one, educate businesses on what's required, right, two, sort of streamline the process so they don't have to sort of go through multiple hoops, but create an environment that encourage entrepreneurship. And I think that is part of the role that government can play to let individuals know that entrepreneurship is uh, possible if you're interested in it. And even when you fail, we're still here to help you sort of pick up the pieces and continue to go forward. I think that's absolutely right. And I think it starts really early. It starts in our schools with our children and what they learn about 
how to build businesses. You know, kids by their very nature are creative, they're imaginative, they're, they're much more willing to try things maybe than we are, to, to, to our detriment, frankly. <laughs> And so they might, they might try, you know, new rules for a game on the playground, and if it's not fun, they'll try different rules. Right. And so I think that kind of innate human desire for creativity, for imagination, it's there. And we just need to encourage it from the get-go and, so, and not see failure as something that brands you forever, but see failure as an opportunity for you to learn and do something great afterward. Two of the, so one of the most exciting things in the community board aid in the Upper East Side area for businesses has been the Cornell Technion project. One of the biggest challenges for businesses in the Upper East Side area uh, has been the Second Avenue subway project. Second Avenue subway project is very important. It's a, it's a very important part of the transportation system and business owners understand that, I think. Uh, and I think they, they have a real sense for what that means. I think they also have a real sense that after the project is completed, that line, that avenue, that corridor, will be really wonderful. If you own a business there, it's going to be really great. It's going to be really fantastic in 2016. One of the problems that we hear the most frequently is from a business who comes to us and says, you know, I'm on 79th and 2nd. Maybe I own a bar on 79th and 2nd. You know, I've got 80% of my traffic is walk-in traffic. I know it's going to be great in 2016. Right. But it's not right now 2016, and I don't know how I'm going to make it to 2016. What can they do? What can a business do? Sure, sure. So there are a couple of things, right? I think first, um, you know, we have to sort of uh, listen to the challenges of each small businesses, right? And part of what we've tried to do is, through our business outreach team, is sort of walk the path, right? A canvas, and, and sort of hear the concerns of small businesses. And you're right. Those are some of the concerns that we've heard. Now, you know, part of what we would encourage, right, for a small business, and, and you know, it, it's, it's probably part of their very nature, and many of them are already doing it. So, you know, for example, for traffic is, is a core part of the business. Are there other opportunities, right, where you can still get to market, right, get to your customers? Maybe there's an opportunity for online, right? How do you sort of leverage a, and build a community online, you know, uh, be it maybe through Delivery.com, maybe through Yelp, you know, whatever the opportunity might be to still sort of harness the community of customers that uh, would naturally sort of patronize you. And how do you reach out to them? Maybe you have to build a delivery component of your business, right? Maybe you have to sort of figure out how you leverage other sort of uh, promotions that will either encourage traffic or you get your product to them. And, and certainly, as you said, um, there's a long-term benefit here. And how do we sort of help small businesses stem the tide in the short term? How do we ensure that they're, they're successful, you know, until this opportunity sort of uh, reaches a point where it's sort of flourishing for all of them? And I think that's part of the challenge, figuring out sort of what individual solutions that each business may have to come up with, but sort of supporting them through the process. Because we know it's not easy just naturally being a small business, but when you have such a significant project that can really impede growth and sometimes stifle businesses, we ought to pay particular attention to that. And Second Avenue is blessed to have the support of some amazing elected officials on the Upper East Side. Uh, Jessica Lappin, Dan Garonick in the council, and Carolyn Maloney, the congresswoman, and not, not to mention you know, my boss, the borough president, Scott Strayer, have all worked to make sure that the Second Avenue subway project, as necessary as it is, uh, includes mitigation efforts. And recently, a new community center for the Second Avenue study uh, subway opened so that people can go there, ask questions, understand what the project stands, how it stands to benefit the community. Um, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be, it's, it has been tough on businesses. It will be tough for the next couple of years. But, you know, I think New Yorkers love to promote their neighborhood. They love to support each other. They love to go to their corner coffee shop or their neighborhood hardware store. This is part of who we are. And I think that it's never more important than now for folks on the Upper East Side to support those businesses that may have struggled over the last couple of years. What role can uh, business groups play in this? Uh, chambers of Commerce, uh, partnerships. I know there's been a lot of work on business improvement districts. What role can that play, particularly when we have a when, when there's a project which makes business, uh, which poses some business challenges in a particular corridor or area? 
Well, in our Startup City report, which is about the entrepreneurial economy, we mentioned how bids and chambers of commerce can come together to provide amenities to the public that actually draws people there. And one of the ones that we mentioned in particular was free public Wi-Fi. You know, it's remarkable. We live in a wired age. We're all carrying around smartphones that have 4G connections, and yet very rarely are there unlocked wireless networks in public areas. And where there are, they've been unbelievably popular and incredibly successful, not just getting people to a park, but also bringing people to a business quarter. So Dumbo in Brooklyn was one of the first bids to work with the city and telecommunications companies to create a free public Wi-Fi hotspot there. And it's been terrific for business. And we've seen similar programs in other parts of Manhattan since Dumbo launched their pilot. And so there are ideas like that that not only can help a corridor like Second Avenue, but can be applicable throughout the city. Absolutely. And, and to add to that, I, I believe that um, we've seen uh, in many instances when there is a, a strong local uh, development uh, cooperation, even uh, post uh, Hurricane Sandy, Right? We saw that uh, the community is able to bounce back faster. Right? So uh, Second Avenue is a challenge for a commercial corridor. But whenever you have strong community organization, they're able sort of to galvanize support, galvanize information, keep the community members engaged. Right? And I think it's absolutely necessary to sort of encourage these community organizations to play a great role to intersect between government right, or major projects or major natural disasters and sort of let them be sort of the catalyst for either stability or for growth or for change, right? So I think there's a strong role for uh, nonprofits or, you know, merchant associations or business improvement districts, not just to create a, a safe and clean environment, but to really play a, a tremendous uh, role and sort of fill in that gap, you know, to connect uh, city government to small businesses across the city. I'm just going to add one thing, because one, one thing sure. that Kelvin mentioned kind of stuck with me. You know, these folks can go beyond just making it a nice place to walk around and shop. Right. And one of the reports that we recently uh, released from the borough president's office, Exports NYC, is all about how we often think of ex the export economy as be being for those big Fortune 500 companies, shipping yeah. with, on these huge tankers going overseas. <laughs> But it doesn't have to be that way. Small businesses can export, and not just export goods, but also export services. Now, we have tens of thousands of immigrant businesses in this city that have very unique connections back to their native markets. And we'd be crazy in New York not to take advantage of our diversity by leveraging that for the export market as well. And so I think bids and merchant associations can do that. And there's a whole list of recommendations in our Exports NYC report of just how we can galvanize this to create jobs. Now, suppose we have one of these external situations. Business has demonstrated profitability over time. No reason to think that it will not continue to be. But there's just a brief, there's a brief reason why the uh, business is, is struggling. Uh, maybe it's an external thing like the Second Avenue subway that's over a few years. Maybe it's just a short term, even something as simple as an extended power outage that's causing difficulty for the business. Where can a business go in order to get credit if they don't have it, in order to try to bridge that gap? How can, how can government work with businesses to provide that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, there are so many instances when you just cannot anticipate what may happen in a business, right? And you can't plan for it. So emergencies, you know, um, you may need sort of short-term capital to figure out how to sort of get your, yourself back on your feet. Or, you know, you may have some interruption and, and, and figure out sort of how do I bridge the gap, right? Um, or you may have planned growth, right, where you sort of determine that, you know, in six months' time you want to sort of tap into a new market. So there are a lot of uh, opportunities where a small business may need uh, capital, Right, may need sort of that, that cash to, to grow a small business. And through our NYC Business Solutions Centers, accessing capital is one of the core services that we have been able to deliver to small businesses over the years. And in fact, last year, we were able to help over 600 small businesses access $62 million in capital. And, um, you know, a few years ago, we were not even in this business, right? And, and we were able to sort of be a connector 
of small business to the resources necessary of, of capital. And it's not necessarily the banks only that have sort of stepped up and sort of improved the, the access to capital, but it's also the nonprofit, right? The axioms of the world, you know, the, the, the credit unions, right? These are the, the, the nonprofits and the alternative lenders that are really taking a, a, a real sort of slice out of the, the opportunity to create access to, to microenterprise and, and small businesses in, in, in communities across the city. But we're, we're sort of taking it one step further. Right? We're looking at crowdfunding right? as a way for small businesses to sort of leverage their network, right? leverage the presence that they may have online, to sort of tap into a new source of capital. And, and we want to educate businesses about uh, crowdfunding. What does it mean to sort of launch a campaign? You know, how can it impact your business? How can you sort of leverage um, the, the network of followers that you have? You know, you have a Facebook page. It isn't just for to drive customers, but now it can be a new source of revenue for you. So uh, through NYC Business Solutions, we've really taken up the challenge right, to help small businesses access capital in ways that they may not necessarily have done in the past, but also to be a connector to existing sort of capital that's always been out there that's sometimes just out of the reach of small businesses. We want to sort of help you create a business plan, right, put a cash flow projection together, get the profit and loss statement, and do all of that loan packaging for you and connect you to the best lender that we think is out there for you. Well, I have to say that it's been, uh, it's been wonderful to hear about the different services and the different opportunities that are open for businesses. We know that opening and running a successful business is a challenge, but I think with the support of, of good folks in government and with good help, business owners can, can start businesses, can scale those businesses, can hire more and more people, and can continue to evolve and can continue to grow the very diverse and wonderful economy of New York City. Thank you very much for tuning in for these two parts of Community Board 8 Speaks. This is Corey Evans, the chair of the Small Business Committee, with my two guests. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful night.